Yes. No. <clears throat> Thank you to Reed for saving my bacon. It's real. Yeah? Okay, yes. All right. I'm Carolyn Duncan. I'm still a humanitarian, and I definitely plan to talk to you about my experiences as a Mazunga living in Kenya. So, and this is a Maasai women's warrior outfit, um, <clears throat> which I picked up in my travels. In the Swahili language, the word for gringo is Mazungu. Can you guys say that? Mazungu. Yeah. You guys are pretty much all Mazungus, whether you're Caucasian or whether you're American. To Kenyans, it's all the same. But it's not really a favorable term. It's more like an idiot wandering through my country. Um, and Kenya is a place that I personally never thought I would go, um, largely owing to a lifelong fear of flying. I'm not talking like, oh, I don't like flying. I'm talking like I would not get on an airplane, not even to go from like Portland to Seattle. So it really surprised me when I found myself um, exploring the opportunity, uh, thanks to a last minute invitation to speak at the White House, the bucket list concept, exposure therapy, where I would drive out to Portland airport and just look at planes, and then an invitation from a friend, like, hey, why don't you come to Africa with me? And I was like, are you nuts? I don't fly. Like, but I found myself getting on that plane in Seattle, heading to Amsterdam for this Kenya excursion. And I thought to myself, well, if this doesn't go well, like I don't enjoy the flight, I'll just get off and become Dutch, and that's fine with me. Um, <laughs> But I did make it to Kenya, surprisingly. And because, um, because I'd spent so much time worrying about the flight, I didn't think at all about being in Africa and experiencing the culture. This is my friend Shantae that got me to Africa. And this is our group that spent nine days in a Kenyan village uh, doing various uh, service projects. Um, and over, since then, it really grabbed me. And I actually have gone to Kenya three more times in the last two years and spent nine months and had amazing experiences from meeting Jane Goodall, the primatologist, to meeting Helen, the giraffe and just um, soaking up Kenyan culture. And um, on my third trip, I went for six months and I was grossly unprepared for the ways that daily living would have to change, like from the type of groceries I could buy to how you get around to um, stocking up on supplies to make it through the frequent power outages. Um, I started to experience culture shock badly, like me not preferring to eat fish and seeing this showing up on the dinner plate, literally this at a friend's house, to having to stop in traffic because there's baboons crossing the highway. It just was a very different style of life. Um, also, like uh, this fine gentleman, uh, they, we went to this Maasai village and they put this face paint on us and we're like, awesome. And then they're like, no, actually, now we're married. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> like, what has happened? And um, anyway, so my favorite like culture shock story, I was sitting in an Uber in Kenya. And yes, they do have Uber there. And we got rear ended and the driver got out to talk to us and a police officer came up and my humanitarian colleague said, if that ever happens, just get out and run, which you would never do in the US ever. But that's what I did. And I started learning learning these Kenyan ways, like eating with your fingers, like rice and beans and stew and stuff. Like, and um, I, I got my hair braided. I'm not Rachel Dolezal, but I mean, it was just fun. And the women there love to see that, that assimilation in their culture, like um, taking a bus with my friends instead of going in an Uber like my expat white friends, um, learning to eat that weird white stuff called Ugali, um, buying groceries and learning to prepare Kenyan food. Um, I really tried to fit in, and I didn't realize how much experience changed me until I came home. This is me drinking three glasses of milk in a row when I got home on my first day because I missed American milk so much, and uh, hugging my cat wearing an uh, African shawl. And I started to like realize my own culture had become foreign to me, and I started experiencing reverse culture shock, where I was saying things half Swahili, half English, started throwing dinner parties and making Kenyan food, and my American friends were like, what is that crap? Like, I'm not eating that. Um, and it's a real thing. I like researched it, and I realized there's levels of different engagement with a culture and the first one is being a visitor where you're such an idiot you don't realize you just got married to a Maasai warrior um, to you know um, being like an expatriate where like you are visiting you're definitely standing out you're not really you know you understand the culture a little bit more so you're not making rookie mistakes but you are not part of the tribe to um, making these efforts to assimilate culture and really understand how the locals live and starting to become a native like I started buying um, Kenyan clothing and wearing it to church, or I learned how to do the hair ties. I was actually participated to be in a Kenyan wedding with um, other people as part of the bridal party, or learning Swahili and being able to communicate with the kids that I was serving. And what that did for me is it opened up that I could get beyond those things and provide more impact as a humanitarian because I was crossing the barrier and being able to relate and interact and people would open up and share their problems and their issues. And I wasn't seen as that foreigner, that idiot Mzungu, I was seen as a friend. 
Um, I will be going back to Kenya in December. You're welcome to follow my trip. And if you're interested in my work in humanitarian things, or you want to tell me about your humanitarian work or your foreign travels, I would love to hear from you. So thank you very much.